I want to begin with a few acknowledgments, if I may. First of all, I would like to thank Gary Peterson, 21st Century Books, and Friends of Science East for promoting and putting together this ad hoc meeting. This is how it really should be. It's small, it's intimate. Tesla would approve of it, I think. I want to thank fellow colleagues and fellow researchers who have helped me in my quest for the presentation I'm going to bring to you this evening. Dr. James Corum and his brother Ken. And of course, also, it should be Dr. Jim Hardesty. Where are you, Jim? And his wife, Judy. I don't know why you don't have a PhD attached to your name. It should be honorable at the very least. That's real. These two people, Jim and Jim, have helped me to authenticate what I'm about to present to you tonight. And this is the first time since 1999 when I first acquired this piece of apparatus that it has been back here in New York State. I'd like to thank the folks of the Hampton Inn for helping to organize this event. I want to tell you that what happened to me in 1999 literally changed my life. Imagine me. I do not have a PhD, but I've been studying Tesla since I first saw the Griffith Park Observatory coil in Los Angeles, circa 1957. Today, I am an independent subcontractor who is about to reinstall that coil, remanufactured, if you will, but still all original, and that happens on the 20th of this month. And yes, the Griffith Park Observatory is going to reopen. Uh, it may not happen until sometime next year, 2007. They're way behind schedule. They've made like a $265 million makeover of the place, including a huge underground expansion. So that was my inspiration. I knew nothing about Tesla. I knew nothing about Tesla coils. As a young boy, I saw the Griffith Park Observatory coil in 1957. And I woke up, and I'm seeing these sparks, and I'm going, wow, that's amazing. And as a young boy, I was also always attracted to lightning, you know, whenever an electrical storm would happen in Southern California. So that's my beginning. And now it's coming full circle. Now I have the privilege of reinstalling that original Tesla coil that was built by Earl Ovington, for Dr. Frederick Finch Strong, who originally owned a pair of these coils and donated them to the Griffith Park Observatory. Originally installed in 1937 after the observatory opened in 1935. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Uh, uh, Clemenshaw, who was the original director of the observatory, and his technical director, known as Leon Hall. And I have correspondence of this. It's on my website. I'll give that to you later. These two coils were set up in the basement. And they arced like 15 feet, 12, 15 feet across from secondary to secondary as a dual half-wave resonance system. But in the main floor of the observatory, there was only room for one coil. So they installed one of two coils. They kept the other one as a spare. And it became an icon for the Griffith Park Observatory. Ladies and gentlemen, it's important for you to know that this was my beginning on my path for a quest of knowledge about Tesla, about Tesla coils, and about electrical engineering. When I first saw that coil, I went home with my erector set and my spool of wire and my wood and what have you, and I made a little conical coil like this. Actually, it was wound with a 500-foot spool of asbestos wire from my father's electrical business. And I had this little rector set motor, and I had these brushes that I made up uh, as contacts that were from a street sweeper that came by several times a week, and they were always dropping their brushes on the street, so I thought, oh, okay, I can make a brush and commutator out of this. I had no idea what in the world I was doing. I plugged it into an AC circuit and blew the breaker. Then I put a light bulb in series with it so it wouldn't draw so much current, and the light bulb lit, and the motor spun, and there were sparks on this little one and a half inch diameter wheel with flat head screws on it, with wire brushes making contact, and I'm going, 
I better stand back, I'm going to get big sparks here. This little coil like this made no spark at all, nothing. And I was heartbroken. I was absolutely devastated. What am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. And I had the realization, I do not know what I'm doing. I got to find out about these things. I got to find out about electricity. I have to find out about physics. I had no one to pursue me in this direction or to force me to go into this. I just decided this is what I want to do. It's too bad young people today don't have that same inspiration. People of the teens, the 20s, the 30s, they had radio, the magic of radio. And the mind listening to the radio is a wonderful thing because it's a universe, it's a theater. You can see, you can feel, you can experience. All you're doing is you're listening, but the mind fills in the gaps. We need to instill that in the young people of today. We need to find a way to attract young people today. Hey, yeah, I got a cell phone. Everybody has a cell phone. This is wireless today. This is the outcome of Tesla's invention. But it's not the future. There are still more things to be done in the future, and we need to find a way to do that. And Friends of Science East and of Shoreham, Wardenclyffe can become a science center. This is a very significant step. Wardenclyffe needs to become a national scientific center that is officially recognized, even by the Smithsonian Institute. It needs to be a place of learning, of exploration, of discovery, and wonderment for young people. Because that's what we have, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we have to give to the future. It's what we bring to them. They are our future. Forget about the war in Iraq, in Iran, Afghanistan. These are distractions. We need to focus on what is really going to happen for America's future in this country as a scientific and engineering leader in the world. I'm going to get off my politician stuff now. I'm going to go back to Griffith Park Observatory, which is my roots. Okay. So I learned about electricity. I read every book I could find at the public library. And one of those books was John J. O'Neill's Prodigal Genius. Oh my God. I was in heaven. I read that book like five or six times over, and I couldn't read it enough. Eventually, and we're moving forward to about 1962, Popular Electronics. How many people have read Popular Electronics back in the 60s? All right. October 1962, an article comes out called Little TC. A Model T forward ignition coil, a small glass plate capacitor made out of a piece of glass four inches by five inches covered with aluminum foil, a little spark gap, a little tiny primary, a little secondary, made sparks about an inch and a half long. That was my first successful Tesla coil. I made one of those. It worked. Wow. And the wonderment of that, seeing the sparks, smelling the ozone, seeing the corona discharge and all the different manifestations, even on such a small scale that you could do, to me was amazing. Well, for me, I always wanted to make bigger sparks. Bigger is better. More power, like uh, Tim, Tim uh, what's his name of Tool Time? Ah, ah, ah. So I continued, and I built larger and larger coils. Eventually, I made a coil that made sparks about four feet long. That's about circa 1965. That's after another popular electronics article called Big TC, which was like July of 1964. And I'm going, well, you know what? This primary has too much loss in the inductance on the primary because it's not heavy enough of a conductor. And the spark gap is very crude. It's just a stationary spark gap. It doesn't need, have any quenching or anything. So I made improvements on that, and suddenly I was making six-foot sparks comes January of 1975, and just as an experimenter, as a hobbyist, I come up with a coil design, which I call Model 5, which uses a torus, an aluminum donut, on top that's 20 inches in diameter, 
five inches in cross section. And now I'm making sparks five and a half feet long off of a secondary coil that's only 24 inches tall. That was my first commercial Tesla coil, and I launched what became known as Tesla Technology Research, which is a company that I still own today. Okay, this is long before the internet. Another person I need to give homage to and respect for, and unfortunately he could not be here with us tonight, is Harry S. Goldman. Lives in what is now known as Help me out here, folks. Queensbury. Queensbury, Queensbury. yeah. Queens Falls. Exactly. Um, Harry started a newsletter, this is before the internet, called Tesla Coil Builders Association. I'm going to put some things on display here, and please, you don't need to say, stay seated here in the audience, because we're going to make this interactive here. What's in this bag is the big surprise for tonight, folks. <clears throat> this is my copy of the Tesla Coil Builders Association News, circa January, March, or February, March, 2000. This is just before the end of this tremendous publication that launched a reawakening of Tesla technology and people who are interested in finding the truth. You know, it's like the X-Files, the truth is out there, it is. And as Dr. Coram described to you, and also Dr. Safer, the truth is out there. And many people have been duped, they've been misled about a lot of Tesla's technology. What you see on the cover here is what I'm about to unveil in this bowling ball bag. But I'm gonna tell you a short story here. We're going to move forward. 1999. Jim Hardesty and I, friends for, as he pointed out to me this morning, for more than 20 years, in Rochester, for many years, was the annual AWA Symposium and Swap Meet. AWA means Antique Wireless Association, the oldest and most acknowledged wireless association in this country. And they have a very rich heritage. And of course, a lot of it's based on Marconi, which is understandable. Well, in 1999, at my day job, where I work in El Segundo, California, I'm sitting down at lunch one day, I'm sitting on my computer and I'm looking on eBay. Hey, what are you going to do during lunchtime? Okay. So I do a search, an eBay search, on induction coils. Because I like collecting induction coils. I come across this auction listed as a vintage rotary induction coil generator. I'm going, wow, what the heck is that? I click on it. Ladies and gentlemen, I fell out of my chair. Literally, I fell out of my chair. I'm going, my God, that can't be. I'm going like this, and I'm going, really? I studied it, and I look at where the auction, the, 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 the auction seller is Tusca, and he has a rating of zero with you know, glasses on, which means like it's a new user ID. I'm looking at location. Ithaca, New York. I'm going, my God, this is unreal. So, I see that the auction closes on August 19th of 1999. It's like the day before. I click on the option, email this auction to a friend. So I send it to Jim Hardesty. And in my email message to him, I say, Jim, Please tell me if you think this is what I think it is and get back to me. A half hour later, he's on the phone. And he can't even speak clearly. He's so excited. He's, you know, like frothing at the mouth. He says, Bill, whatever you do, you need to close this auction. I said, Jim, I got you. I'm on top of it. Well, at the time, I had just a dial-up connection, not a high-speed connection or anything. So I know how to play that game. I'm going, okay, fine. 
So I put in as my reserve in the last five minutes of the auction, $20,000. I figured, okay, if somebody's gonna outbid me, they know exactly what I know what this is, and they're gonna outbid me, and that's tough luck. And if I win it for $20,000, yeah, I'll have to get a lien on the house and take out a loan, but that's okay, I'll do it. <laughs> Whatever it takes, because I believed in it, ladies and gentlemen, that's strong. I closed the auction. And the auction closed at $89. Yeah. Yeah. There was a total of nine bids on the auction. Yeah, there were other snipers out there. Okay. I emailed the auction results to Jim. Now the seller, or sellers, ladies and gentlemen, were located in Ithaca. Ithaca, that's where Jim and Judy lived, right on 2nd Street. So we got on the phone, I said, Jim, I got the motor. He says, I want your permission to go there. I'm gonna pay him cash. I'm gonna bring the motor back here and have it here at the house until you get here next week for the AWA meet. I said, fine, do it. A five minute walk around the block. Ron and Galena, her name is Galena, like a crystal. They wrote an email letter to me. She writes, you are quite welcome. Thanks to you and Jim, this is perhaps the most smoothest eBay transaction on record. <laughs> I'm sure you will be pleased when you see the item, and it's really quite interesting as far as the antique objects go, and its age and appearance lend a remarkable appeal which I guess was the thing that attracted me to it in the first place. And my interest in vintage science stuff. Well now Ron and Galena, it turns out, they're staffers. They worked at Cornell University. Now, once a year, Cornell holds an event, which is called Einstein's Attic Rummage Sale. They're participants in this thing. They see this thing. They buy it from Einstein's Attic Rummage Sale knowing that it came from somewhere in Cornell, that's all I know, for 75 cents. I bought it for $89 and Jim paid for it. And when I came to Ithaca, I said, Jim, I got the money, here. He says, no, your money's no good. My claim to fame in this transaction is that I paid for this motor. I said, okay, fine, you got it. Right, Jim? That's it. Let me make a couple of comments, if I may. Please, come up. The, the, um, this story is truly one of the most amazing experiences that I can ever tell you about, because I can remember uh, Judy said, there's a note here from Bill, and we looked on the site, and it says induction coil motor. And I looked at a picture of it, and I, just like Bill, uh, realized that uh, this is ridiculous, you know? I mean, how can this be? It ter I see that gentleman occasionally, the fellow who does this, they're still selling stuff on eBay. And what happened was Cornell, uh, always looking for room for professors to do their research and stuff, it takes this stuff and, you know, you know, like other things have happened, like uh, uh, original uh, uh, radios from Elmira, New York, I, forget, uh, um, what's I uh, can't remember the name of that, they, they threw one of those out. And and, uh, and Cruiser missed buying it one time because he didn't believe I had one of these. And somebody else got it. <laughs> But the point is, they gave a bunch of the stuff to the science center that had Einstein's attic, which still exists. As a matter of fact, my friend Graham over here actually is one of the proprietors of that now that it's in a different building. But, but that uh, motor was given to the science center to sell. And these people got it. They bought it. They looked at it and said, oh, this is neat. So they paid 75 cents for it and figured they'll put it on the internet and make 25 or 30 bucks and la di da di da di da I, Bill gave me the address of the place. I, I realized... This is ridiculous. This is, remember that, Judy? I, I'm, I'm freaking out. It's around the corner. So I walk around the corner and I knock on the door. And they open up the door and sitting on the dining room table, inside the door of the house, is this motor. And I'm, I'm wait a minute, this is not possible. This could be, that's when I ran back and I said, Bill, I don't care what you have to do. Whatever it is, get it. You know? Mm -hmm. And I know, like, when you finally got it and I went back, I. I, as a matter of fact, I think I even tried to say, listen, I'll give you whatever for the thing right now. Don't even put it up. But they, of course, they said we couldn't do that. So at any rate, that was just the thing, and we finally got it. And remember that time I was saying earlier, we had it on the, well, I think it was on my car or something sitting there.